Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, just on the front end, I want to let everybody know. Good morning. I want everybody to know we uh, ran out of copies of the PowerPoint and the evaluations. More are being printed and they'll be distributed to you as soon as we have them available. So, just a touch. Um, and one other housekeeping uh, issue before announcing our presenter. Who needs no one <laughs> Is uh, we have three microphones for questions. There'll be two up front and one in the back. If you're going to ask a question, raise your hand, please, if everyone can help pass the microphone to the person who's asking a question and make sure to just switch it off. It's a switch at the bottom. Oh. Um, any questions? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> so today we have Ellen Bacon Wiley from the California Pilot Project. Yay. Uh, Yay. Yay. She needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, she, she's been there with, with the California Pilot Project since 2017, but before that, in 2007, she was with Ladle. Uh, she's been a writ attorney, a supervising attorney, attorney extraordinaire, and she's here today to present on various issues about the appeals. Um, she's, as she communicated to me, she'll go through the PowerPoint fairly quickly and open it up to questions and also address some questions that many of you have submitted previously through our survey monkey, which we appreciate you guys using. Um, and without further ado, here's Ellen Big One. Hi everybody. Um, as Jabron said, I uh, was here where you are, although we were in a not so nice building across the way, much more crowded, uh, for 10 years before leaving to go to the California Pilot Project. So um, coming back to Lido always feels like coming home um, and I, I hope that by me being here, us up at California Pillow Project don't seem so much like we're in the ivory tower. Um, most of you see our names on emails. We'll get into why we are constantly bugging you uh, for certain things in a minute. But it's, we're all trying to work together because we all do have the same client. Um, I'm going to go through the PowerPoint pretty quickly, and the reason I'm doing that is because I was emailed your questions that some of you had filled out. Um, Y'all are really worried about IAC, very clearly. Um, and I do want to have a lot of time to be able to go through some of them. Some of the questions you asked me, specifically some of your questions on ICWA, are very detailed responses and probably should result in another training, but I'll touch on as many as I can. Um, so I'm going to start at the very basics. John, I'm going to start the room. Okay. Oh, there you go. There, okay. Mm -hmm. We're talking about appealable orders. Um, and the reason why I wanted you to have the PowerPoint as a handout was so that you weren't furiously jotting down all this information. But we start at 395. A judgment in a proceeding under Section 300 may be appealed as any final judgment. Then, the way that's explained is in case law, the dispo is the judgment. You may not file a notice of appeal from detention. You may not file a notice of appeal from jurisdiction when disposition has been continued. Um, there is a flat 60-day timeline. It doesn't matter if your adjudication is in April, and then let's say you go out 90 days for dispo. You still cannot file that notice of appeal until disposition happens. The dispositional order is controlling. Two exceptions to this, because there's always exceptions in the rules of law, restraining orders are directly appealable. Uh, even if they are made before jurisdiction happens because they're under a separate provision of civil law, they are directly appealable. The other exception to this is 360Bs, because you don't get to dispo on a 360B. So you take your appeal from jurists and the court's order of a 360B, okay? Um, that's why many of you get emails from us, because what happens, um, I'm gonna go through this one. This is basically everything I said, 60 days. 60 days, 60 calendar days, not 60 court days. If the 60th day falls on a weekend, it's the next court day. You do have an extra 10 days if you have your hearing heard by a referee or commissioner, but go ahead and wipe that out of your mind because you're going to start getting yourself in trouble. 
Um, it's like when I set my alarm clock fast and then I start calculating in my brain how much more time I actually have. Just let's let go of that. 60 days. Um, I took some examples of this from actual real life notices of appeal that have been filed by your colleagues. This attorney wrote other appealable orders. The, the attorney wrote termination of jurisdiction and all other appealable orders during the life of this case. <laughs> nope. Uh -uh. You're getting that one. The one where termination, where jurisdiction was terminated. You didn't appeal this bill? Too late. You didn't appeal a 2NE where you didn't like the finding? Too late. You're done. Um, it doesn't remedy it because you file one notice of appeal at the end of the case. What do you file? Yes. Oh, there's a question. Yeah, just really um, quickly. Would it change if there were previous appeals at the dispo, uh, at the dispo time and at the status review time if somebody put that because previous appeals were already stating the issues? They should state? No. No. This particular one, there were no prior appeals. I don't know what counsel was doing. Um, but the you don't have to restate the notice of appeal and I think somebody did this recently and it resulted in an email here's the situation with your notice of appeal you or you take your client or whomever goes to juvenile court clerk's office files that notice of appeal a juvenile court clerk looks at it sends it dockets it sends it over to the court of appeal a court clerk at the court of appeal looks at it enters it, gives it a court of appeal case number, sends it to us. We're the first attorneys who are looking at your notices of appeal. Um, that's why we've had a lot of situations where notices of intent are deemed, notices of appeal, and vice versa. But we're sort of the, the point where it reaches an attorney where we have to go through them, we have to look at the minute orders, and we have to notify the court of appeal if there's a problem with them. Um, so it doesn't, it, it, it gets confusing if you write, I'm appealing from this, 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 and this, because you're not going to get the same set of eyes looking at that notice of appeal. Uh, it's not going to kill it, but it's not, just make it easy, because the clerk's office here is very overburdened, the court of appeals clerk office is very overburdened. Um, notice of appeal versus notice of intent. You file a notice of appeal post disposition with the exceptions I talked about earlier, restraining orders 360B, and any subsequent order unless a 26 was set. This seems to be where people are getting tripped up, and these are the two scenarios I've seen recently. The case comes in, the kid has been home with mom. Case comes in on a 342, kids removed again, and the court says you're out of time. The court adjudicates the 342, the court disposes the 342, tells mom she's out of time, sets the 26, counsel files a notice of appeal for the 342. Mm -hmm. Anything happening in that hearing. And the generate the way that the court now generates the minute orders with a different minute order for everything, you get a different minute order for the 388 versus the 26, has the juvenile court clerks going bonkers and just shooting everything in as a notice of appeal. So it gets to us. I have to call Steve Schoenfeld or Nicole Johnson, who don't like me anymore, uh, and say, guess what? It's coming back to you later. It's not us. So the just be careful about that. Anything else that's done, if the end result of that day is you are marking your court appearance sheet that the next hearing is a 2-6, that is not a notice of appeal. Anything that happens. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And watch for kids on different tracks. Because sometimes <coughs> you have the kid who you're just on a review hearing, and maybe you're filing a 2 &E, but that same day, it's adjudication, dispo, denial of FR. You're filing a notice of intent on that kid. Yes. Dennis, will you need a microphone? Oh. And, uh, hello. Hello. Is it working? Yeah. It was. Let's try it again. There it is. There it is. You got it. You got it. Hi. So that's, and it's because 
there's not time for an appeal to be heard before a 2-6, right? That's the underlying reason? That's the underlying okay. reason. When, when we used to file paper copies of writs, they got red covers, and they went to the priority of the calendar. They still do. Um, the writ attorneys, after they receive that record, have, was it 10 or 15, Jason? 10 or 15 days to file that writ. Um, and it usually is accompanied by a request by the writ attorney to stay the 2-6 proceeding pending the outcome of the writ. You don't have that in an appeal. The records prepared faster, the RTs prepared faster, the timelines to get it filed are faster because it's supposed to move so much faster than an appeal. Um, and you have the unit that does it in-house for you here at Ladle. Those do not come to us. Um, there is another exception, because there always is, is a petition for writ of mandate or what we call emergency writs. Um, those, as I understand it, are now taken care of by the senior twos in your office. Um, what you, one, if the court ever denies you, if you file a affidavit of prejudice under CCP 170.6, and the court says no, the statute holds that your remedy is a writ, not an appeal. And again, it's for the reasons Dennis said, it's supposed to be fast. Um, Jeff M. versus Superior Court, if you're making objections to adjudications going out on timelines, that's what we used to call a Jeff M. writ. That has to go to the Court of Appeal. Why? Because it's supposed to be fast. What it does require is that the writ attorney show exceptional circumstances as to why the Court of Appeal needs to hear this immediately. Appeals, guys, can take a year or more. Um, and so when you have done an outstanding job and your bench officer has said, you know what, counsel, I agree with you, I'm going to go ahead and release over the department's objection, and they go immediately to the Court of Appeal and file a writ. They have written child safety issue, immediate stay required, redetention all over the cover of that writ. They are trying to show the Court of Appeal, hey, you need to act on this now. Um, if you are unclear as to whether or not it should be a notice of intent, whether it should be a notice of appeal, or whether you should be filing some type of emergency writ, you need to consult with somebody in your office, or, I mean, you guys can email me or call me. It's much easier to fix these things before something is filed than it is after. Uh, the form. Okay. Um, basically, hopefully you all have seen a form. You know what the notice of appeal looks like. Um, it can, they change the rules, it can be signed by the client or the attorney. It used to have to be signed by the client. And it has to be liberally construed. The clients, as Ms. Pace can tell you, we went through hurdles and hoops and obstacles and under tables to try and get her client's notice of appeal to be filed by the juvenile court because in the number one, he left it blank. He filled out everything on page two, including all the dates of hearings, but one of the clerks here decided he didn't fill out number one, so he was out. Um, it's supposed to be liberally construed, which is why we got the Court of Appeal to issue an order directing the juvenile court to file his notice of appeal. But it really was, it was an awful experience that Ms. Pace and I would not like to repeat. <laughs> um, to that end, when I was here, the notices of no court action used to go to Marlene Firth. I don't know how you all do it in your firms, but if the juvenile court clerk decides, no go, your notice of appeal is not getting filed and it's getting rejected, they are required to notice you with a notice of no court action explaining why. Please do not leave those in a pile of unopened mail on your desk. That should be a, oh crap moment. What is going on? Because if they sit on your desk, there is probably very little that us or the Court of Appeal can do for you. Oftentimes you open it and it's something dumb. We had one where the client printed her name but didn't sign it. They rejected it. 
You can, if sometimes after that happens, you are still within that 60 day window to fix it and get it refiled. So please don't hold on to those and wait for one, somebody down the line to point it out because your client knows that they wanted to file a notice of appeal and it will come back at you if it's not done. So look out for those notice of no court actions because you can fight them. Um, if you feel like in Jody's case, if the notice of no court action had come anywhere, which it didn't, um, they could have taken, her office could have taken a writ on it, requesting a writ of mandate issued at the juvenile court file that notice of appeal. So it's, easy, it's easier to take care of the earlier it's caught. So please do not leave the notice of no court action just sitting there. Um, this shows how it developed, usually developed narrowly tailored. Now we, now we liberally construe them. So, um, and the Court of Appeal generally does, especially when we're dealing with clients who are going down to the clerk's office and uh, filling them out themselves. Um, I think I put the notice in there in case you don't know what it looks like. I don't, I don't know why. Um, the page two, oh, I know why I put it in here. Okay, so you're, you're filling it out for your client. It doesn't matter. There was an old adage that at the top you needed to put your client's name in pro per. It doesn't matter. We know you represent them because your name's on the minute order. Um, so that is that does not matter. I appeal from the findings and orders. You don't have to be specific here, guys. You don't have to say, you know, the court shouldn't have issued the restraining order because mom wasn't actually in fear of dad because of that. You don't, oh, you can put the date, okay? Just please double check your dates too because when you put the wrong date, it's a mess. Um, the appeal is filed by, that should be your client's name and information. Um, some of you are putting care of, which I can't tell if some of you just don't want to go look at the current address because you're doing it on the 59th day at four o'clock or if the client doesn't have an address but know that you're on the hook and you are going to be getting a lot of calls from appellate counsel asking you where the client is because the duty then goes to them to be able to talk to the client. So do so at your own risk. Um, number three, I request that the court appoint an attorney on appeal. I was or was not represented by an appointed attorney. This, what this does is for the court of appeal clerk trigger, trigger whether or not a financial affidavit is needed. When we have appeals from clients who are represented by Vince Davis, uh, Kyle Pirro, Ken Sherman, um, if they want appointed appellate counsel, they check that they were not represented by, uh, or they were not represented by an appointed attorney. What happens is when that notice of appeal goes to the court of appeal, the court of appeal sends the client a financial affidavit to fill out, evidencing their inability to pay for court appointed appellate counsel. If the court <laughs> believes that they can afford it, the court denies it. I'm like, uh, if, if they were represented by Ladle, you, they, they should not get a financial affidavit and there's, there's something in the record indicating that they can afford counsel. We have one right now where the appellant owned multiple homes. Uh, he's like four or five residences, yet was represented by a court-appointed trial attorney and was denied appointed appellate counsel. So if you mess up on it, there's an extra set of eyes if you put the wrong box but generally, for all your clients, they were not represented by an appointed attorney uh, in the juvenile court. Hold on, I need my phone. Javon, right behind you. They were, they were, they were, they were. Sorry, did I say it wrong? Yeah. 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 If they were not represented by Ladle, put was not. But, but really, they were. They were sorry. <laughs> I was represented by an appointed attorney. No financial affidavit, usually. Yeah. Is that your question? Okay. So I mentioned this earlier, but this is where they go. They no. go to, oh, sorry, that wasn't the question. Okay. So I have filled out the appellate form with my address for my clients that have a confidential address, if there's a restraining order in play. Um, is there any other form to fill out to indicate that? No, you can put confidential because what happens is both the court of appeal and the appellate attorney receive a copy of the court file 
which is going to have the client's address in it. Now, what may happen at the Court of Appeal is the clerk may input your address, um, but that you can you can call you can see if it matters enough to you to call the Court of Appeal and give them the confidential address. Um, so the notices of appeal start here. They go to the Court of Appeal, and then they come to us if uh, they need appointment of court appointed counsel. We don't represent them at CAP. I get a lot of phone calls saying, my legal attorney told me you were representing me. That's not exactly how it works. Um, the CAP is made up of two very distinct divisions. One is criminal, one is juvenile. Um, criminal has 15 staff attorneys. They do take some staff cases where they represent the clients on appeal themselves. Dependency for CAP right now compromises 55% of the appellate project's caseload. There are now five of us. There were three of us two years ago. There's now five of us. Last month, we received 205 appeals between the five of us. Um, we don't need your work. <laughs> so please don't feel bad if you talk your client out of taking a non-meritorious appeal. Um, but because of that high caseload that we have, that prohibits us from really doing any staff cases. So unfortunately, a lot of times the clients contact me and they want to tell me all about their case. Really what we, are, what we are is the administrative arm of the Court of Appeal that manages, supervises, and trains the panel attorneys. That we have mm, 85 panel attorneys that do strictly dependency on our panel. I get a case, I'm looking at it to see how complex the issues are, what's involved, and then I am reaching out to some of my panel attorneys who I know may have experience dealing with mental health cases, whatever it is, to see if they're available to take the appointment, and then I give that name to the Court of Appeal. Um, I also get a lot of phone calls saying, my trial attorney told me to call you because they don't know what's happening on my appeal. Uh, it's all right here. And really most of my comments to the parents are, I walk them through how to do this and how to sign up for email notifications on their appeal so that they don't feel that they have to call me every day to find out if anything has happened, especially when we're waiting for the record to be filed. Because of the number of cases we have, we do not appoint attorneys until the record is filed with the Court of Appeal. That can take anywhere from 30 to 60 days, and we're just waiting on the juvenile court. There's nothing I can do to make that process go faster. There's nothing you can do. It's not gonna help your client to go to the second floor and yell at them. Um, that's just, they're, they're behind too. So all you have to do is really go to the Court of Appeal website, search case information. All your cases are in the second appellate district. You can search by the trial court case number. They're not even always using the A's, B's, C's, and D's, so you can just put the root number in there if you don't know the B number. Um, I wouldn't suggest you search by party because that can make it a little bit more difficult when you're using initials. Some of our divisions use initials. Some of them use the first name of the child and the last initial. Um, you'll get a docket. This will tell you Every, the B number, the Court of Appeal number, what division it's assigned to, what's going on. Um, this is the timelines for the juvenile court. 20 days is not 20 days. Um, appeals from termination of parental rights are deemed fast track cases. Those records are supposed to come in, they go to the top of the docket, and they were supposed to be given priority for appointment of appellate counsel. As you can imagine, once you get to a termination of parental rights, your records are probably at least a thousand pages. I have one that's a four thousand page record. Um, those take some time for the juvenile court to put together, get all the reporters' transcripts because we get all the reporters' transcripts from detention, adjudication, the time FR was terminated, and the two six. And if you're in Lancaster, a lot of continuances. Uh, but. We get all those, and that takes a long time. So even though those are designated fast track, it doesn't always happen as quickly as we would like. Um, the Court of Appeal has a ton of new clerks, and they are actually backlogged. So 
We have a table in our assistant's office. Right now, records are just appearing, and we have zero information on them because the Court of Appeal is now backlogged due to the volume. So we're trying. Um, I'm going to turn to justice ability because it's sort of, I think, as a trial attorney, something you need to appreciate when you're in the courtroom about what's going to happen on the appeal. Uh, my colleague, Dan Zrom, who some of you know because he's a former CLC and former legal and just came to CAP a few months ago, was going to come with me today and we had this whole amazing skit. <laughs> but unfortunately, Dan had too much work to do, so he couldn't come. Um, basically, you're looking for a justiciable issue. And what does that mean? It means, can the Court of Appeal do anything for that parent? Mm -hmm. So the classic example we get is mom and dad are involved in domestic violence. And dad appeals. Mom did not appeal. So the Court of Appeal is likely going to say, we can't do anything for you because the court would, the dependency court would still have jurisdiction because of dad's conduct. Or we have a parent, here's, a, here's an example of this notice of appeal. So trial counsel files a notice of appeal under number one. They specify the B2 count relating to mother's mental health and nexus of risk to the child. That's great, that's awesome. But there's also a sustained methamphetamine account on B1. And on B3, there's an inappropriate plan because mom left the kids without grandma for, with grandma for months. So is there anything we can do? Maybe not. It's a very narrow exception. And what we're looking at is, um, you know, can mom be non-offending? No. Uh, is it going to effectively change her case plan? Maybe. Would she have had a better argument for dispo and home of parent? Maybe. So there are some ways that the appellate attorney can try and finesse it. But what I, I guess what I'm trying to get across to you, and this is what the basis of Dan and my skip was, uh, if you fight hard on behalf of your client and dad's attorney does the same thing, you need to talk to your colleague about whether or not they're filing a notice of appeal. And if they say, I am, then you need to go down with them and file one on behalf of your client too. I get that sometimes there's parents who are just like, no, just give me my case plan, I want to do my services. But there are times when I read a record and think, where the heck is the other parent's notice of appeal? Or for that matter, where, where's minor's notice of appeal? Because they joined the parents. So when you're going to file a notice of appeal, rally your courtroom colleagues who were on the same side with you and talk to them and try and say, let's just, let's do this, you know? Like, we don't, we can't make great law when we're constantly trying to play defense on the department's motions to dismiss. And what the department's doing right now, guys, is they are pushing out the briefing schedule as far as they can, coming back in with a request for judicial notice and filing a motion to dismiss the appeal based on subsequent events. We can't do anything with that. But if you can rally your colleagues when you all fought really hard on an issue to all, all take it up, we will appoint counsel for minor, for mom, for dad. We got it. Um, and we've done it before to make sure, even though it's unsaid, I'm sure you guys can all, it won't be a stretch to know that the Court of Appeal really has sort of a heightened scrutiny when minor's counsel has appealed. Like, wait, what's going on here? Um, there was a recent case, minor appealed. I thought there was a snowball's chance in hell, and Division One reversed. Um, I do think, fair or unfair, that they do take a closer look when you have more and more. And it's very frustrating for our appellate attorneys that they see, they see where you're going, they see where you were headed, but they can't do anything about it because it's just not going to work. Hey, you need a microphone. Okay. Um, my question is, what if the parents are differently situated? Like in a case, for instance, if it is definitely uh, like the court can sustain against the father, but mom is more of like non-offending, does that make any difference? Does, does the dad also have to file it, or mom can just file it by herself? In that specific scenario that you said, the relief that the Court of Appeal can give is to make mom non-offending. 
So if mom was in one account and her and dad are, are not aligned, if she's in one account and as a basis of that sustained count, the court removed or gave her a very complex case plan or whatever, the argument could be made by appellate counsel that this case is right and it's appropriate because mom can be made not offending. And that has effects for her on her dispo portion due to removal, due to her case plan, you know, whatever it can be. That's the scenario where it's okay. What I'm talking about is when, like a dirty home case, um, you know, where both parents basically had a dog in the, in the fight, or a marijuana case where they're living together and they file a marijuana count on mom and a marijuana count on dad, and then we see moms and we're all sort of scratching our heads saying, where's dad, where's the kids? Because in some cases, not as many as I'd like, CLC is coming around to the idea of nexus and marijuana very slowly, but it seems like some of them are getting there. Um, so I'm going to go to the next slide because that's what you're talking about is multiple bases for jurisdiction. And this is what I had mentioned before. You've got a mom with a whole litany of issues. If you single out one count on that notice of appeal or, you know, in, in your explanation to the appellate attorney, it's probably not going to go anywhere. Um, one big exception to this is if it's a D case. Because obviously sustaining a D, even if mom is also using drugs, um, if there is a D sustained, usually we can let that go on a public policy, sex offenders are bad, no one wants us on their record type of angle. And I want to note, it varies depending on the division. Um, in, in Division One, they'll hear the merits on everything. Um, and in fact, one of our attorneys had to oppose a motion to dismiss, and I was like, I don't know, I guess you could try, I don't see it. But not only did the court deny the department's motion to dismiss, they issued a reversal of the entire jurisdictional hearing um, based on one count to mom. So some of the other divisions, you're, you're done. There's not much you can do. So it just varies, and we never know what division you're going to get. Um, also, to your question, two offending parents, one appellant, um, when dependency jurisdiction is justified based solely on the unchallenged finding against one, the reviewing court need not address the jurisdictional findings because why you only need one count to take jurisdiction over a kid. So um, it doesn't always mean, it means that appellate counsel is probably facing a motion to dismiss. Um, and if they feel strongly about that count, then they will have to probably incorporate that into their argument. Sue, I saw you going for the microphone. Um, can you say something about when one parent appeals and the department declines saying that they're not the proper respondent and what action is appropriate if the time to request appellate counsel has told? So, okay. So, uh, let, me, let me just give a little bit more background, Sue. A lot of times the scenario that this presents itself is Mom and dad are duking it out over the final custody order. Uh, dad prevails. Mom's not happy. Mom goes and files a notice of appeal. Because I think of the backlog that county council has in their written appeals department, they are sitting on cases, then looking at them <coughs> three to four months down the road, then filing a letter with the court saying, eh, we didn't take a position. This isn't our fight. We've called father's trial counsel. We've called mother's trial counsel. We've called minor's counsel, letting them know that they should be the proper respondent. Um, if you get that letter, if you are notified of that letter, if you know that you had a very contentious custody order hearing and your parent, is, the other parent is taking an appeal, you need to let the senior two in your office know. The court of appeal is not happy about this one. I had one where the department submitted four requests for extension of time. The opening brief was submitted almost a year ago, and they popped up with a letter saying, eh, mom's a proper respondent. Um, and the Court of Appeal knows about this. So the senior twos are hearing for, from us more often, earlier on in the case, like, hey, are you going to do anything here? Um, if that happens, if um, we have custody orders, 
Um, sometimes it's a home of parent order, paternity actions. If you're if you have mom and we're super opposed to dad's claim of paternity, or if you have another father, you need to keep your senior two in the loop. What they have to do then is file a request with the Court of Appeal requesting appointment of counsel for the parent as a respondent. We need at CAP a specific order from the Court of Appeal ordering us to find an attorney for a respondent parent. And we have to get another copy of the record. So there's sort of all these things that happen. Um, I told Jason beforehand that I'm always using him as an example. Jason knows this, he's very good at this. Um, if, if, if you know that your case was part of a petition for extraordinary writ filed by the department, your writ attorney already knows, but they should be watching it because if the department does not prevail on that writ, they file a notice of appeal. Um, we have had one case that we got no response on from trial counsel that the department filed its opening brief. There was no response by anyone no kid no parent nothing and do you want to guess what happened <laughs> it got reversed um so we can only do so much to try and say hey guys hey uh, i have one in my inbox from one of the divisions yesterday saying we've tried to contact trial counsel on whether or not they're requesting uh respondent and we haven't heard anything so uh, keep your keep your writ attorneys in the loop so that they can help you kind of be proactive and like I said The Court of Appeals to on your timeline question is really unhappy and it's not so much with the ladle firms It's that the department sits on these cases <coughs> for months and then comes back and says yeah Well, we're not the proper respondent and time is is going so um, let them know um I'm going to go through this quickly. I think I covered all these. These are the exceptions we're talking about when we're talking about just disability. Offending versus non-offending. Could affect future dependency or family law proceedings. Serves as a basis for dispositional orders. And policy, which like I said, typically applies in the um, sex cases. Um, appellate review. Fact finding is not a function of the reviewing court. Do not, and I actually had an appellate attorney tell me that her ladle attorney told her client she got a do-over in the Court of Appeal. That is not what this is about at all. Uh, what the appellate attorney gets is a copy of the clerk's transcript with all the reports and minute orders and any other documents and the reporter's transcript. All this other stuff that your client wanted admitted and you didn't have admitted, it doesn't get admitted at the Court of Appeal either. There's no new evidence coming in. All they're doing is looking at the four corners of the appellate record for error. That's all they can do. Um, so please don't tell them that they get a duel. Um, issues of fact and credibility are questions for the trial court. Credibility is something we come across weekly. Uh, if the court makes a specific finding of credibility <coughs> against your client, we are hard pressed uh, to do anything on appeal. Um, and that, it, it makes it pretty tricky for us because there's very, there's a ton of law about it that the trial court is in the best position to see the witnesses, to hear the witnesses, to observe the demeanor of the witnesses who testify and make that determination as opposed to reading a cold transcript. Um, oh my gosh, Javon just told me I had 20 minutes, okay. Um, arguments and representations and some of these things guys I will go back into your questions at the end uh, unsworn statements of counsel are not evidence I gotta be honest with you for the most part I skim closing arguments because it's not evidence I'm sort of curious what your position was and what your argument was and then I go to the court's decision um, it's it's not evidence so anything that you're saying as eloquent and you know, as, as zealously advocating you are doing for your client in the closing argument, it's not evidence. Um, arguments of counsel amount to unsworn testimony. Unsworn testimony may be evidence if the other side does not object. So one of the questions that somebody submitted was, what do I do when minor's counsel is saying at counsel table, my client says this, and my client says this, and my client says this. You object to evidence not in the records and say, Your Honor, could the court please ask my
Miners Council not to testify. If she wants to, he, he or she would like to take the stand, then they can do so. But if you're not saying anything, then that comes in. So yes, you should absolutely object because I've been here, they do it all the time or they have concerns. And those concerns <laughs> delve into <coughs> comments that were made out of court either by the caretaker, by whomever. If the court pushes back and says, what do you want me to do, counsel swear in? Okay, I got, I got all morning, let's do it. Um, because they don't get away with it because they represent the, the poor children, okay? <laughs> Sorry if there's any minors counsel in this room that I'm offended. I don't mean to. Um, Post-judgment evidence. Okay, Sue Dell and I can talk about this one really well. <laughs> Please, let your appellate attorney know what's going on. And I think for some of you, when I get a wrong notice of appeal, or something's not right on the notice of appeal, or it's not timely, or it's premature, I am emailing or CCing your firm director and a supervisor. Please do not take it as any of us at CAP are trying to get you in trouble. Quite the opposite. The reality is we are acutely aware that a lot of people change courtrooms, that there is unfortunately quite a bit of turnover, and we never know we're going to find the right person. We know we're going to find the right person if we CC the firm director. We know it's getting read and it's getting to somebody because so much of this is time sensitive. If you know you have an appeal, you need to communicate with appellate counsel, especially if something happens that dramatically changes. If you took an appeal on behalf of dad from Juris Dispo, and in that brief appellate counsel said, court, court aired, court should have sent the kid home, and then while the appeal's pending, the kid <coughs> goes home, what's the effective relief that the court can provide? Nothing. Nothing. So please call the appellate attorney and let them know what has happened. Because if you don't, we get nasty opinion from the Court of Appeal about you, about the appellate attorney, and we get a phone call from the justice. And we don't like to get phone calls from the justice about what's going on. So please communicate with them. They are not trying to be burdensome, but they have a duty as well. Uh, that goes into mootness doctrine. This is the basis for why the department's pushing everything out um, because they can come back and say everything is moot. The, if the appeal doesn't stay the juvenile court's proceedings, which most of the time it doesn't, it goes on. So you can close a case even if there is an appeal pending. Under Judge Nash, the former presiding judge, he had a, a judge order that said they couldn't do it, but it wasn't founded in any type of rule, and they certainly can do it. Um, I'm just gonna say something really briefly about Phoenix H issues. Uh, Phoenix H is akin to the Glen C that the writ attorneys file when your appellate attorneys looked at everything and can't find anything. What I want you guys to know is we have also looked at it. Before any of our attorneys can file a no issue brief, it has to be reviewed and approved by one of the staff attorneys. There have been times, and it's documented, where I have said, no, I think, I think you could argue this, and they filed the Phoenix stage anyway. That does happen. Um, but we have to review it um, as well before they can do it. And the same thing goes for ineffective assistance of counsel. We have to bring any claim that a panel attorney brings to us and says, hey, Ellen, you know, the attorney did this, this, and this. I'm thinking of filing IAC on it. What do you think? I have to bring it to the unit meeting on Tuesday mornings and present it. Um, it has to be done by consensus. So somebody asked, are we looking for IAC? No. <laughs> I don't like it. I have been where you all are. I know the size of the caseloads. I know the clients. I know the courtrooms, most of them. Uh, no. None of us are looking for ineffective assistance of counsel. We have required them to come to us for a couple reasons. One, although many of our panel attorneys are very versed in appellate law, not all of them have worked in a courtroom on a day-to-day -day basis, and sometimes they have unrealistic expectations of what trial counsel should, should not do, can, and cannot do. Two, we recognize that most of the panel attorneys are earpieces for the client and are hearing what the client has told them about how awesome this 388 was going to be, but their attorney didn't file it for them. 
And third, if a panel attorney is going to seek an IEC, they have to get approval from our executive director for more money. That's the, the reality of it too. Um, so document your files. If your client brings you documents for a 388, you don't file it. Make sure it's in there why you didn't. Um, just please be sure to document everything because we are going to call you six, seven, eight months down the line um, about, you know, Mr. Hernandez and you better hope that you remember him because counsel's going to ask you these questions. We've also told the attorneys that they should, if they're going to have a conversation with trial counsel about potential ineffective assistance of counsel, that they need to do so in the presence of a supervisor or a firm director. You should never get a brief from a panel attorney, at least in the second appellate district, I'm not going to speak for San Diego, alleging ineffective assistance of counsel that you are not aware was coming. Okay? Um, that is not what we do. That is not, we do not, we do not try and put the fear of God into trial attorneys. That's not how we make good law for these people. Um, so please, if you ever are concerned about ineffective assistance of counsel, or anything like that, you guys have outstanding supervisors and firm directors and seek them out, your writ attorneys, the writ department, about what you are doing or not doing on this case. Um, so I'm gonna try, <coughs> how much time do I have? Watch me go now. 13 minutes. Okay, all right, so okay, let's get to the questions. Uh, what are some common things <coughs> attorneys do that constitute IAC? Uh, my attorney did not communicate with me is number one. And they will, from the immediate notice that they have an appellate attorney, that is their number one claim. I never heard from my attorney. They never told me what was going to happen. I didn't know about the hearing. Um, I mean, and everything, okay? Um, incarcerated parents, please do not forget about them. Um, Please make sure that they are aware of every hearing. If they can't be there, if they weren't transported, if they waive their appearance, they know what happened and what's next. Don't forget about them because they are some of our biggest complainers in terms of what happened at the end of their case. Um, that's probably the, the big ones where we've had actually to look at IEC. Uh, another one we get a lot is where CLC should have declared a conflict and didn't. Um, but the parents one, it almost always relates to attorney-client communication um, for you. I know you're not a floater anymore, senior one. The flo what used to be the floaters when I was here, you guys are most at risk for this because you're going out to the client, talking to them, going in and doing their hearing. I never met this guy before. I, I didn't know who he was. He spent two minutes with me and we went and did my case. So be careful. I'm not saying you have to continue everything, but I am saying just be careful and make sure that you specifically are documenting that file about what you talked to the client about, what you went over, how much time, whether the client had any questions, whether or not you were answering it. Because they're seeing your face for the first time, so you are the easy fall guy or woman. Yes, Emily. So would you say, would you say that documenting your file is really important? <laughs> I would, in fact, say that and underline it and hold it if I could. Yes. Um, okay. Well, I heard, yes, Amy. Just to follow up on that. So when the senior ones go in and the court tries to tell them, oh, no, you're going forward on this contest today. I'm not continuing it. I said no further continuances. Doesn't everybody remember that? Would it be appropriate for those coverage attorneys to say, Your Honor, it would be ineffective assistance of counsel for me to proceed today. I am not prepared on the case. I do not have a relationship with the client, etc. I have said that, and in front of Marpet, I threw in due process. <laughs> when Marpet was trying to make me do the exact same thing, and I said, Your Honor, if, and, and by the way, Your Honor, you're violating my client's due process rights. So yes, okay. absolutely, Thank absolutely. You. Um, uh, I've heard that a case remanded for ICWA is all counsel's responsibility and can be IAC if an attorney ignores ICWA on remand. What duties do we have to ensure ICWA is being followed properly on remand? Okay, ICWA is a whole fun-filled hour and a half. Um, but 
<coughs> the first thing I would tell you to do is get a copy of that reversal from the prior appeal. You need to know what the error was. Either you're looking at the AOB, you're looking at the opinion if there was one, or there's a stipulated reversal. You can call appellate counsel and say, hey, I have this case again on remand, can you just give me an idea of what I'm looking for? There's nothing wrong with that. But if you go in and you have no idea why it was reversed, and you're just there, um, it's going to be a, it's going to be a problem, and we have a client who's been back five times for violation of ICWA and 419, uh, <laughs> and, it's, and and DS keeps saying, I I don't see the error here. I I don't know why they're doing this. Um, <laughs> that's a problem. Okay, so the first thing you ha you have to know why it was reversed, um, and it's not necessarily that it's an IAC. What happens is it's deemed a forfeiture or a waiver. And the only way you can overcome a forfeiture or a waiver by trial counsel is to bring an IAC in. Um, so just get a copy of that opinion, call the appellate attorney. Um, they're always happy to talk to you about the reversals they've gotten. Um, will a case closing out at a 364 moot an appeal as to adjudication dispo? Sometimes. Um, if your only issue, the only issue on appeal was home of parent, and now the case is closed, it may. Um, if the issues were whether or not the court had jurisdiction in the first place, it may not. Um, Donna Bernstein is excellent at this. If you read her record, she says, when the court is closing the case, Your Honor, although Father's agreeing to close the case, he's not waiving any arguments made in an appeal as to the court having jurisdiction in the first place submitted. I mean, <laughs> she's excellent at this. Um, and putting it on the record. So it may. Please, if it does happen, communicate with the appellate attorney. There are circumstances where they may want you to file a subsequent notice of appeal, and there are times when they'll say, no, I got this, let it go. Okay, so if it does happen, communicate with that. <coughs> While I am on that, do not file a notice of appeal from termination of jurisdiction before that custody order has been filed and that stay has been lifted, it is premature. Let me say it again. If the court closes the case, issues a stay, and then sets a hearing for the receipt of the juvenile custody order, do not file your notice of appeal until that custody order is received and that stay is lifted. It is premature. Um, and our appellate attorneys at this point can be know what to do in terms of extra motions and things like that, but it is an extra motion. So if you can not do it, don't do it. Um, what's the line between prepping your client to testify and coaching? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get into that. I'm going to refer you to a supervisor on that one just because it's a lot. Um, case, case, courts will go forward on matters even though notice is improper. If the other evidence seems to indicate a parent is uninvolved and the parent doesn't show up, we can't reach out to these clients. What authority do parents' counsel have to appeal matters when notice is bad? What constraints exist on that authority? So you have an absent client, and you think, yeah, they weren't properly noticed. Um, the, the rule that was set forth in Helen W. is it's a prima facie showing if you signed it that you had the ability to do so. The only way this could come back is if the department, for some reason, filed a, a motion to dismiss based on the fact that you didn't have authority. They don't have time to do that. Um, if it, I'm going to get to this one because it's kind of important. If the child is detained at the initial hearing but returned to dispo, then later removed on a 387, does the FR clock start at the initial detention or the 387 detention? 387 detention is the answer. Can a parent in the middle of an FR period be TFR'd on a 387 dispo? Um, can a parent in the middle of FR, not if they're receiving FR for the first time, FM if the kid is returned. Now, the important distinction to know is there is a difference between a child who is not removed at dispo and a child who is removed at dispo, returned at a 2NE, and then re-removed. In that scenario, where the kid has been initially removed, returned, removed again, that clock is running. They don't care whether or not it's FR versus FM. If the child is removed for the first time at 387, that's when FR kicks in. Okay, that. 
timelines are a mess. Okay? <laughs> um, what actually happens when IAC is found? What does the state bar do, if anything? Uh, when IAC is found, it will be in the opening brief. If it's a colorable claim, there will be a simultaneously writ of habeas corpus. Um, the state bar, I know of none of our panel attorneys who call in referrals against fellow attorneys. I think that's just not what we do. Um, the Court of Appeals certainly can make a referral in its opinion to the state bar, but I certainly don't expect any of your levels of representation to dip below reasonable, so I don't think that's going to happen. Um, is dependency practice, I like this one, is dependency practice an inherently easier area of law to commit IAC because of the types of clients, caseloads, etc.? I think it's probably a little bit, I don't say easier, because I think, I think it's, it's, uh, it's certainly a more frequent discussion we have because of the clients, because of the caseloads, because of the nature. Um, but our criminal attorneys have IAC calls every day from prisons. Um, so the clients, regardless of what arena they're in, it's always someone else's fault, and they usually want to blame their attorney. Um, what should you say on the record when minors counsel starts testifying? We talked about that. Um, when you're, if you're in front of a commissioner who does something crazy, how do you decide whether to file a request for a rehearing or emergency writ? I would talk to your senior too um, and find out what they think based on could they make that bless you, could they make that colorable claim for immediate relief? If they can't, then you're probably headed towards a rehearing. Uh, many of our 388s are denied without a hearing. We know. Uh, what should we be putting in the written petitions to at least get a hearing so our client can testify? Change versus changing circumstances and best interest. That's where we lose them. Um, you gotta have you gotta have changed circumstances. What does that mean? I can't tell you because I don't think that anybody knows what that means. Um, but you you need to have something. Now recognize is it on appeal? Is it a loser because you didn't get a hearing? No because the appellate attorney could still make an argument that there was prima facie showing that the court should have set it for a hearing. And honestly, sometimes that's the easier argument to make mm -hmm. than the argument that after a full hearing, substantial evidence supported the relief you sought. Um, so I wouldn't worry about, I wouldn't worry about whether or not feeling bad that you're not getting a hearing on something you thought was great, um, because it's not always a bad thing. Um, okay, hold on. Okay, I just need to tell this one because this one's funny. There's a bench officer who's infamous for playing with her cell phone while <laughs> witnesses are testifying or attorneys are arguing. Is it appropriate to call her out on it? And if so, how? <laughs> as much as I would like to comment on that one because I'm pretty confident I know who it is, um, I, I, would, I think that's something that the firm directors need to do. On. Um, and, uh, okay. After a judge has been reversed, can we file a 170.6 and get the case to a different bench officer? Absolutely, unless it was a ministerial error, okay? What that means is the box wasn't checked, it was an ICWA violation, whatever. If it's a reversal on the merits, yes, comes back 170.6. Um, <clears throat> there's one more question about remitters that I'm gonna get to and then I'll close with that. Uh, why do we have remitters? Remitter basically is a fancy term for this is your opportunity to petition to the California State Supreme Court. So that's why we have the remitter period. It means the case is still sort of in limbo because after the opinion has issued, either party has 40 days to take their case and petition for review to the California Supreme Court. It is possible for appellate counsel to confer with the department, with minors if they're represented, and any other parties to stipulate to an immediate issuance of the remitter. That means everybody's saying, yeah, no, I'm not gonna bother with the petition for review. If that's something you want, because you want those kids home or whatever it may be, talk to the appellate attorney and see if they're willing to do it. And most of the time they are. Um, but that's what that period of time is. And that's why you find our bench is very like, oh, I can't do anything. It's because that case technically is not final until that time has run anybody has filed a petition for rehearing in the Court of Appeal and or a petition for review in the Supreme Court. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Woo!
Okay, if anyone didn't get any of the handouts, please let me know.